The Glasgow subway is one of the oldest metro systems in the world. Over 30,000 people use it to get around the city every day, totaling nearly 12 million riders a year. But here's the thing, Glasgow is not a very big city. I mean, there's about 13 Glasgow's worth of people in New York City alone. And while the Glasgow subway is very old and its ridership numbers are very impressive, it's still just one single bi-directional six and a half mile loop. And for the past 128 years, or even longer, depending on when you're watching, that's been the route. But why? There's plenty of other parts of Glasgow that would be well served by this kind of high quality transportation. And of course, over the years, there have been a number of proposals to expand the system to these sorts of places but none of those have gone anywhere. It seems like most small or mid-sized cities, especially in the US, are afraid to build something like this today. Why is that? Today, we're gonna look at two related yet distinct questions. First of all, why hasn't the Glasgow Metro changed in over a century? And second of all, why have so many cities in the US of similar size not even considered building a metro system like Glasgow's? Welcome to Ringo Urbanism. The Glasgow subway first began operating all the way back in 1896. At the time, only five cities in the world had already built and opened fully grade-separated metro lines. London, then Chicago, then Istanbul, and then finally Glasgow and Budapest both began service the same year. But notably, all of these other cities have since expanded their systems whereas Glasgow still only has its one original line. Now, once you're done watching this video, if you're still interested in learning more about the history and quirks of the Glasgow subway, you need to go check out Jeff Marshall's Secrets of the Glasgow Subway video, linked in the description. Now, of course, it's worth noting that the existing line hasn't been neglected. It was electrified in the 1930s because originally it was cable powered and it was once again modernized in the 1970s. And recently, there's been another push to improve and modernize the system with brand new trains which recently went into operation this very year. And they're slated to soon become fully automated once all the stations are retrofitted with platform screen doors. But for today's purposes, I'm more interested in why the system has never actually been expanded beyond this one route. And luckily for me, back in 2017, the Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, the current operator of the Glasgow subway, published a report that summarizes the various times throughout history that expansions to the system have been proposed. According to this report, the oldest known proposal to expand the system dates back to 1937. This proposal involved adding a fairly straightforward second line extending north and south from the city center. In 1944, there was a proposal to build the original subway's evil twin. More proposals followed in 1948, 1954, 1988, and even as recently as 2010. So why did none of these happen? Well, the original 1937 proposal was likely canceled due to the perceived oncoming threat of World War II. Glasgow is the latest city to come under the fire of Nazi bombers by night. Pretty fair. The 1940s proposals ended up diving a bit deeper, but the 1948 proposal that I mentioned was actually a part of a comprehensive study on public transportation in Glasgow known as the Fitzpain Report. This report actually ended up ruling out subway expansion due to the technical constraints of the existing line. See, the Glasgow subway is so old that it wasn't really built to any particular standard. Its tunnels are way smaller than those you'll find in other cities, which means that the track gauge is narrower than most systems, and that special trains must be designed specifically to suit these tunnels. Here's a size comparison between the Glasgow subway vehicles and a tram in Edinburgh. These subway trains are tiny. So instead of expanding the system according to its unique size or adding a new larger standard into the mix, the 1948 report recommended electrifying some of the existing suburban and regional rail routes and adding more routes according to this standard. The conclusion was that it is impracticable for the subway to be adapted or extended, but that it must be retained as a separate entity offering the possibility of interchanges with the emerging electric rail network. Yes. Um, impracticable. Impracticable. How very impracticable. It's a very impracticable. <laughs> practicable. <laughs> yeah. And this 1948 study essentially set the tone for all of the other studies that have been carried out since. Sure, they might look at a possible extension here or there, but they tend to end up determining that the best course of action is to maintain and modernize the existing line while supplementing it with other services that are 
ultimately less expensive to implement. But what about building a new system from scratch here in the US? Well, when I talk about building a metro system in a small to mid-sized US city, I generally get one of two reactions. First, there's the idea that just because other cities have something doesn't mean that every city needs to copy that thing. Plus, US cities are always gonna be car first, and any changes to that status quo need to be subtle and unassuming in order to get funded and done. On the other hand, you have people who point out that if a city is big enough or at least ambitious enough to be considered for something like, oh, I don't know, the tallest building on the continent or to host an Olympic event, it should probably have some kind of reliable rail-based transportation to efficiently move people around the city. Let's just imagine hypothetically that we do it. We go all in, Honolulu style, and decide to build the first metro line for our mid-sized city right now in the 21st century. Of course, the project will face political opposition, environmental lawsuits from NIMBYs, and dozens and dozens of regulations and design requirements that have been heaped on over the years in an attempt to standardize new rail projects and to help them avoid repeating the design mistakes made over a hundred years ago by cities like Glasgow. We've got to consider the impacts of any required road closures, right-of-way acquisition, and station locations. For building underground, add in some massive cost contingencies for unknown conditions that will likely be discovered as soon as we begin excavation in the oldest and most historic part of the city. Is your city on a coastline or near a river that floods occasionally? Underground tunnels will need a specialized drainage system and an emergency water pumping system. Any historic structures nearby? These may need temporary structural shoring or bracing during the excavation process to avoid any potential disasters from cracking due to the vibrations below. And on top of all of that, there will be some insane costs for the specialty contractors who would likely need to travel in from out of town due to none of the local contractors having experience with the highly specialized construction means and methods required for such a project. Unfortunately, I do fully understand why, when presented with all of these hurdles and costs, hardly anybody in charge of a mid-sized city today is seriously entertaining the idea of building a new, fully grade-separated metro line. For politicians who are only in power for a brief period, this kind of upfront expense is often really hard to defend when the real benefits might only start to become clear decades in the future. I briefly mentioned Honolulu earlier, and they were only able to push their project through a massive wall of political opposition due to their even more massive traffic congestion issues, which of course are caused primarily by the geography of Hawaii. What so often happens with these projects is that a particular service is proposed and studied. The city will hire a consultant to look at the cost and logistics of implementing a full metro system, and they'll compare it to the cost of adding Oh, you know, a tram or a bus instead. Planners will then look at this study and determine which option to ultimately build. Since the city's public transportation department only has so much budget and political will, they'll typically end up picking the path of least resistance, sticking to the cheapest and easiest system to build that will still generally meet their goals. Because of course, if they spend all of their money on one project, they won't have any money left to operate buses or well, really to do anything at all. This is how so many projects start out with the possibility of becoming a grade-separated metro line and end up as a tram in mixed traffic or even just as a half-hearted attempt at bus rapid transit. Part of the issue is that it's so hard to quantify the benefits of a metro system over a tram system and the benefits of a tram system over a bus system. And if the benefits aren't quantifiable, it just makes it dang near impossible for a politician to justify supporting the price tag. But quantifiable or not, the benefits of an actual metro system are very real. The Glasgow subway gets nearly 30% more annual riders than the most used bus line in New York City, and nearly double the ridership of any other bus line in New York. 13 Glasgow's worth of people live in New York. Both the space and time efficiency of a frequent metro line is unmatched, especially by cars, as a single train can hold hundreds of people and a grade separated train has no need to stop at stoplights or maneuver around unforeseen road conditions. Speaking of which, metro system is also much safer than any system which shares space with 
unpredictable individual drivers. If you think autonomous vehicles are a good idea, imagine how much simpler it is to automate a train that runs on a track in a dedicated tunnel on a fixed schedule. Of course, if it's that straightforward to automate, it's also simple to navigate, especially when clear wayfinding is applied to routes, which are straightforward and simple to learn. The permanence and reliability of a metro system encourages people to live completely car-free, knowing that they can always rely on the route's continual existence to plan their life around for 128 years and counting. This in turn reduces the overall demand for parking spaces and allows developers to build buildings that truly provide value to the city, unlike parking lots and garages. All of these people out and about taking the train from place to place are also sharing public spaces and interacting with neighbors and visitors alike, which genuinely brings the community closer together. It also helps give people a sense of civic pride, identity, and a network of eyeballs to help maintain safety. As long as we're building stations with accessibility at the forefront, this kind of transportation can totally help provide more opportunities for younger, older, and disabled folks who can't drive or would need help getting into a bus. Every city that is serious about truly taking care of its citizens, its natural environment, and that has any interest in economic growth and development beyond its current state, should be building and maintaining a metro system right now. Those that aren't are simply falling further and further behind. And as we discussed, there's an immense set of challenges for any smaller city that's brave enough to actually start working on this. But we should do these things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. One of the issues I didn't mention yet that any city might run into while working on their first metro line is simply the existing layout of the city. See, I live in Oklahoma City, which was at one time served by both regional rail and local electric streetcar. That being said, the city was never laid out in anticipation of a future metro system. When the city eventually does decide it's worthwhile to build one, the design of that future system will fundamentally impact the layout of the city from that point forward. You may or may not have noticed, but if you pay really close attention to why a city looks the way it does on a map, you can often uncover some really fascinating stories about that city's history. Daniel Steiner's videos do a really great job of uncovering the links between urban geography and history, and his videos inspired me to make this video about the surprisingly fascinating story of why Oklahoma City looks the way it does today. It's a tale of hopes and dreams, unprecedented growth, and unprecedented tragedy in a city that's only seven years older than Glasgow's subway system. And if you've already seen that and you're interested in watching our next video, you can go and watch it right now over on Patreon. Thank you very much. You guys rock.